be a good time to start. Um, so I have the distinct honor of presenting uh, Dr. Layla Matty to our grand rounds this morning. Um, Dr. Matty comes to us from University of Pennsylvania, where she's a head and neck cancer and reconstructive surgery fellow. She completed her residency at University of Pittsburgh, where she was a T32 postdoctoral scholar. And uh, in the time she has entered the field, she has been nothing short of immediately impactful. Um, she received a health uh, services research grant from the Academy of Otolaryngology, in addition to other research grants during her time at Pittsburgh. And um, part of her main emphasis has been to study the cost of cure and the topic of financial toxicity in head and neck cancer survivorship. Um, this nicely merges her academic background, uh, obtaining a, a major in finance in undergraduate, in addition to her master's in public health uh, in medical school. She's amassed well over 40 peer review publications at this early point in her career and has already become a thought leader on the topic of financial toxicity in head and neck cancer patients. So um, with that said, uh, we look forward to hearing your thoughts, Dr. Maddie. Well, thanks. That's a really, really kind introduction. So um, with that, we'll try to share my slides. Um, great. Does that work for everybody? Hold on one second. OK, so um, uh, I am uh, really excited to share with you today um, uh, some of my background research um, and findings for this um, topic and really what happens um, when a uh, pandemic hits. So, you know, none of this can be done um, without the work of a team. Um, and so I really have to thank all of these um, leaders, uh, really, um, and research associates, especially uh, Dr. Badur, who is an applicant this year and has been a research fellow with us for uh, two years at Pittsburgh. And so also you can't do this without support um, financially and from uh, faculty. And so I'd like uh, to also acknowledge the funding support that has gone into um, all of this work. And uh, of course, the um, uh, mentors and supporters along the way. And so, you know, what is financial toxicity? And it's defined as the objective and subjective um, patient level impact of the costs of care. And, um, you know, what, uh, what we have come to understand is that the cost of cure does not just end um, with treatment. And so here um, we have uh, Dr. Zafar and Abernathy. Um, Really, uh, ASCO initiated um, the concept of value in healthcare in uh, 2007. And um, this framework for understanding value really um, tries to understand um, what is the relative uh, cost to other treatments um, and uh, toxicities, as well as the out of pocket costs um, for patients. And so it was then in 2013 that Dr. Zafar and Abernathy really coined the term uh, financial toxicity. And a, a really, I think, significant perspective um, for the term was their emphasis to really liken financial toxicity to the toxicities that we observe um, with the physical toxicities that we observe with treatments. Um, so you can't really talk about um, this without talking about uh, health insurance. And so there's basically a couple of um, health uh, models and you have the uh, beverage uh, model and these are um, basically like um, uh, national um, healthcare uh, systems like the UK and Portugal. Um, you have the Bismarck model, which um, entails um, uh, several European um, uh, uh, systems, um, a national health insurance like Canada, where uh, most um, a point of uh, service uh, care is uh, um, paid for uh, by the government. Um, and then the out-of-pocket model, which is um, basically similar to what we see in the underinsured um, and uninsured uh, populations. And so 
The United States is basically a patchwork. It has a little bit of everything between Medicare, Medicaid, a VA system, um, and the Affordable Care um, uh, Act. Um, and so uh, we're, we're sort of a hodgepodge of everything. And so what I hope to do today is um, talk about um, the prevalence of the problem, uh, what causes it, what happens when it actually happens, and what do we actually do about it. Um, and so how do we actually measure um, this problem? And so there are so many tools um, that uh, comprise of national survey data, um, of out-of-pocket expenses, insurance claims, um, a number of patient reported outcomes that have been validated. Um, most recently, the financial um, toxicity index um, tool from uh, Toronto um, uh, surveyed about 400 patients, which is probably the largest cohort um, in head and neck yet um, over a four year span. And then what I really want to focus on is the uh, cost and the FDQ, which I'll talk about in, um, uh, in the next slides. And so before um, we get to that, um, how common uh, do we see this? And so um, using um, objective measures like out-of-pocket um, expenses or a proportion of your expenses from your income, um, almost half of cancer patients report some amount of objective financial toxicity. And then when you look at subjective measures like patient reported outcome tools like the cost um, uh, metric, um, this is almost three three quarters of our patients. And so that's a non-significant, that's a non-trivial um, proportion. I think I just wanted, to, oh, it's not coming up, but anyway. Um, so when um, we looked at financial toxicity in our um, cancer survivors, um, this was a um, cross-sectional analysis um, uh, looking at uh, patients in a multidisciplinary survivorship clinic um, and we uh, predominantly looked at um, squamous cell carcinoma of the oral cavity, oral pharynx, larynx, and hypopharynx. And so here um, we see uh, our two primary outcomes, which are patient reported outcomes for financial toxicity, the cost um, and the FDQ. So the cost is a, a widely validated, um, uh, probably one of the most commonly used financial toxicity tools. It's 11 items and it's based on a Likert scale format. And um, what's important to know is that here, lower scores represent worse toxicity. And then there's an, the FDQ questionnaire, which is basically a two item question that's derived from um, a larger sociodemographic survey from the University of Pittsburgh. And it had been used in a lot of um, other comorbidity or more um, um, disease processes, um, but it has never been validated in terms of its psychometric properties to other um, financial toxicity tools. And so this is just gives you an idea of what this looks like. You have the cost on the left and then the FDQ, and we created basically an ordinal scale to measure um, the FDQ. And the first thing that we find is that, again, the graph shows um, cost on the vertical axis and FDQ on the horizontal and lower cost um, means worse toxicity. And we found that the cost and FDQ um, highly correlate. And so uh, maybe this uh, could be something to um, use as a screen for financial toxicity. And we found that nearly a third of our survivors experience um, financial toxicity. And when you think um, about what causes uh, this issue, it's really um, the interrelationship between uh, objective and subjective distress. And this derives from uh, basically higher um, costs during treatment. These are for your medication costs, your treatment costs. Um, and this is um, uh, aggravated by decreasing your assets and your wealth. Um, possibly from loss of employment or decreased employment, um, a decrease in your savings or your assets that are used to pay for these higher costs. Um, and then the anxiety that comes with not only the cancer diagnosis and treatment, but with the cost of this care. And so what puts specific individuals at risk um, for higher toxicity? And so regardless of what kind of um, measure you use or tool, these are factors that have been uh, generally consistently 
um, associated with financial toxicity. And so you see, you know, sex, uh, loss of income, lower income, a younger age, um, um, no health insurance, obviously, and then living further away from treatment centers. And I think this starts to really highlight some of the um, disparities in treatment that is really part of all of this um, uh, paradigm. And so in uh, our analysis, we found um, that uh, patients who had lower education levels um, on the right, patients who were not married, and then what I think was really fascinating and something that has never been uh, really reported before was that patients with larynx and hypopharynx tumors had the worst um, toxicity out of all of our groups. And this was really the first um, site-specific determinant in head and neck cancer um, that had been uh, reported. And I think that starts to ask more questions, you know, in terms of is there an employment uh, issue or discrimination that's happening for patients who become potentially aphonic or not as um, you know, uh, functional from a voice standpoint after treatment. So um, in regression modeling, uh, we also found that uh, patients with um, younger age, those who started out with um, less earnings and not just that, but a loss of earnings are also um, at higher risk for toxicity. And so basically the older you are, the more you make and the less you lose, the more you pr protected you are from, um, from this problem why do we even care? I think that's the ultimate um, question that comes down to a lot of uh, research questions. Um, and it's because that um, this uh, problem has really been associated with a lot of other significant problems like lower quality of life, psychological distress, um, bankruptcy. Um, and uh, the two things I really want to focus on are uh, treatment interruptions and um, mortality. And all of this can really be explained by this relationship. The higher toxicity you have, um, the lower your overall well-being is, which is something different than quality of life, um, and the lower your quality of care is, which is something I'm going to kind of de delve into a little bit more um, later on. And then ultimately, these uh, impact uh, your mortality. And so here is Dr. Ramsey. He's one of the lead uh, thought leaders in financial toxicity. And this is a, a study out of uh, Washington. And here, um, you know, Dr. Ramsey and his group found that uh, across um, all these cancer types, breast, colorectal, lung, and prostate, um, there were uh, higher rates of uh, uh, higher rates of bankruptcy were, and higher rates of death. Um, associated um, with having to uh, report or claim uh, bankruptcy. And I think what was really fascinating is that patients with cancer had a two and a half times rate for declaring bankruptcy. And if you did declare bankruptcy, you had an 80% greater mortality risk. Now, I think this is really a landmark paper. It was the first time that financial toxicity was directly linked to um, uh, specific oncologic outcomes and here really survival, which is the, you know, which is what we ultimately um, look at. And so um, when we looked at our uh, cohort, um, we use the uh, University of Washington quality of life uh, metric, obvious, uh, um, very, you know, uh, well known to uh, this field. Um, and uh, we found that first social quality of life and physical quality of life, which are two um, subscores of the of the entire um, metric as a whole, were highly correlated. And I think this matters in how you think about looking at these um, quality of life uh, subscales in uh, analyses. But that's fancy statistics that is outside of this talk. Um, but the bottom line is that um, uh, basically um, patients who had uh, worse quality of life scores had worse uh, toxicity. And so this just really um, validates and reinforces a lot of the other uh, literature that has been done in other cancer types. And so what do patients do um, about it? And, and um, all those lifestyle um, modifications, um, that's what um, patients cut out. They cut out vacations, they cut out um, purchasing or even taking prescribed medications. Uh, they potentially don't go to appointments. 
So a lot of the things that I think we've traditionally thought of as non-compliance may not really be a compliance issue. Um, and it's not to say that financial toxicity is the only reason that patients don't show up to visits or take their meds, but I think it's a different um, factor that we have to frame in terms of our uh, thought about compliance. And when we look again at our population, um, we found that over 60% of our patients use some kind of financial coping mechanism. And here that means um, either using savings or loans. Um, and so patients who had, um, uh, who used um, uh, savings or loans had a higher um, rate of financial uh, toxicity um, and severe financial toxicity. And it's not really just about um, having to pay for cancer care. And I think this is uh, critical to understanding sort of a concept I'll be coming to, which is financial fragility. And so um, when we look at um, cancer spending, um, you know, 7% of our national uh, spending comes right out of the pockets of our patients. And it's been shown um, repeatedly that uh, out-of-pocket costs associated with cancer are higher than other chronic illnesses. Um, and there's a lower willingness uh, to pay for care. And I think this comes back to the compliance issue, a lower willingness to um, have to make decisions about where those expenses go. And so um, in this study, which is um, basically builds off of the earlier work, um, we wanted to understand really the uh, association between objective costs and subjective um, um, toxicity. And again, I don't think they're one in the same. And so uh, there's been very little that's been done to actually look at the relationship between the two, particularly in, in head and neck cancer. And so we looked at um, retrospective claims data. I think one of the benefits of being um, at an institution that also has a health plan is that you can very um, uh, easily uh, find claims data for that cohort. Um, and then we also looked at uh, the cross-sectional survey data that um, uh, uses the survey um, uh, metrics that I talked about earlier. And so, um, this represents on the vertical axis, um, the out-of-pocket costs, the horizontal axis describes the different types of um, insurance um, types um, amongst the group. And what you can see is basically there are varying diff, um, levels of out-of-pocket costs based on insurance. And overall, the average annual um, per member out-of-pocket cost was uh, about $700. And I think we sometimes take it for granted or think, you know, $700 really maybe isn't that much for a year. Um, but when you consider, um, you know, 40% of American families can't cover an expense over $400. And so um, when this is just one aspect of your life, $700 can, can mean a lot. And the, another key theme is that these expenses don't end with cure. Um, you can see here that over time, um, even four or five years out, there are expenses that can exceed um, even the first year um, or two of treatment. And this makes me again ask more questions. You know, where are these costs coming from? Is it from surveillance imaging? Is it from um, multiple providers and multiple copays? Is it from the ancillary services and treatments that you need for now dealing with your toxicities from your initial treatment? And so I think trying to understand where these even longer term um, expenses come from is really important. And this goes back to understanding the relationship between out-of-pocket expenses and subjective toxicity. And what's really, um, I think, important here to see is that along the uh, horizontal axis, you have your time since treatment, um, and then uh, your out-of-pocket expenses on the uh, vertical axis, and then um, the blue dots represent um, patients who have high toxicity and the um, triangles represent uh, patients who have low toxicity. And what you see is that even patients who have no out-of-pocket expenses um, throughout years of treatment or time from treatment can still have high toxicity. And so when you look at this a little bit closer and you try to understand um, cash inflow, um, again, you see here um, basically plotted um, income at the time of their diagnosis, 
and income at the time of the survey. And again, this was a cross-sectional study. So, um, you know, the income uh, at the survey was post-treatment. And so um, the uh, pink represents low toxicity and the blue represents high toxicity. And if you sort of look through all of this noise, potentially there's this signal that maybe there's a floor effect, a, a basically a um, cash inflow amount or um, income amount of, uh, below which patients are more susceptible to toxicity. And again, for our, our group here, this was around $80,000 uh, of an annual income. Um, and again, put that into perspective um, of a federal poverty level for a family of four, um, which is around, uh, you know, just shy of 40, 20 to 40 thousand dollars. You know, um, it doesn't take much um, to um, to potentially spark uh, financial toxicity in our patients. And so. Um, what we see is that it's not just about cash in, um, it's also about cash out. And so it's not uh, only an absolute uh, income uh, issue. And so here you see that on the horizontal axis, um, uh, there's uh, patients who had a loss of income and then those who experienced no loss of income. And again, we see that uh, patients who had a loss of income uh, still had worse toxicity. And so this comes down to this concept of financial fragility. And so what happens now when you add a pandemic onto uh, cancer care? And so, you know, this is something that I think we've become very familiar to in terms of the 1918 flu pandemic. Um, I think it's incredible to put into perspective that um, 500 million were infected, 50 million deaths, I think we're at close to 2 million global deaths. So I think we've come a long way um, in terms of modern medicine. Um, and we look at a lot of the same uh, public health measures. Here we have a naval hospital that is wearing the same protective equipment that we pretty much do. Um, here there's a emergency field hospital that's set up in Kansas. You could see they already knew about the six foot rule uh, even back then. Um, here, there's a uh, class that's being held outside. So they understood you don't really need to send your kids home to torture uh, the family and parents, just have school outside. Um, and I do want to um, say that there's no women in this, which did not happen until the Title IX um, uh, amendment. Um, uh, so, um, you know, uh, we uh, tend to, um, you know, I uh, feel that shelter at home uh, may have been really difficult, um, but how about going to quarantine camp? This is in Australia where patients with uh, co um, I want to say COVID, patients with the flu were sent um, to quarantine. And here um, you have uh, soldiers at a camp in New Jersey. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about antiseptic uh, topical therapies for uh, COVID right now. And Basically, here, uh, soldiers were using salt water, um, but maybe what they were really missing was just betadine, um, which was actually created in World War I just in time um, for the flu. So um, here, you know, uh, it comes back to some of the issues that we're even dealing with now. Do these public health measures um, uh, hurt the economy? And it's um, a really interesting uh, study from the Federal Reserve Bank that looks at basically um, changes or reductions in manufacturing, which is measured by changes in, in employment on the X axis, and then um, mortality on the horizontal axis. And then each dot represents a city level mortality. And the green dots are places that had stricter um, non-pharmaceutical health interventions, which are public health measures that we know of. And then the red dots are places that had worse or more lenient public health measures. And you can see they didn't have Cleveland on here, but um, you could see that there is Cincinnati in green and Philadelphia and Pittsburgh in red. And so clearly Ohio um, did a better job than Pennsylvania in general um, with public health measures and um, mortality. And so what you see here is that um, pay, uh, places that had um, more uh, strict um, uh, public health measures actually had um, uh, smaller reductions in manufacturing. Um, and in fact, uh, it had 
longer term improvements in their economy um, compared to places that had um, less uh, strict measures. But, you know, what if you can't work from home? Um, and so uh, this looks at our patients who um, uh, had uh, basically answered if it wasn't uh, according to their um, uh, uh, employment um, type. And we found that uh, almost two thirds of our patients um, can be affected by these shelter in place or stay at home or work from home um, uh, rules. And um, almost 50% of uh, this population, which really captures the Western Pennsylvania um, catchment area, work in some sort of manufacturing uh, type. So, you know, there's not only challenge challenges of working through a pandemic, there's challenges of working just with cancer alone. And so um, about uh, half of um, uh, cancer patients actually even work full time. Uh, half of them lose their job or quit. Um, they're less likely to actually get reemployed after they do quit or lose their job. And um, they have a greater loss of productivity, which may um, circle back to decreased functional status related to treatment related toxicities. And so, you know, again, it, this goes back to the insurance question. Um, you know, despite um, expansion of the Affordable Care Act, um, almost 50% of Americans still get their uh, insurance from uh, employer sponsored insurances. And so as of just 2020, 14 states had still not expanded their Medicaid um, programs. And so many low income adults fall into these sort of coverage gaps where they don't qualify for Medicaid, but they also don't qualify for uh, subsidized marketplace um, insurances. And um, when you look at uh, the affordability of care, I think there's a recurring concept and theme of underinsurance. And underinsurance is defined by the Commonwealth Fund as um, greater than 10% of your income is spent on health care costs. Um, and then these kind of vary depending on your um, poverty level or how much your um, income is at baseline um, or uh, potentially how much you spend for your deductibles. So greater than 5% of your income spent on insurance deductible is considered under insurance. And the rate of under, underinsured adults has doubled since 2003. And um, the underinsured have, you know, potentially the most toxicity because they um, have been shown to pay at least a third of their income in healthcare costs. And this is not just a low income uh, problem. And so while there have been expanded coverage options, a lot of these plans have high deductibles and they can be unaffordable because of premiums and the cost sharing requirements that are shifted to individuals. And so what, what's the problem? Um, you know, why not get a better job or better insurance? And uh, again, cancer patients um, have been shown to feel a need or this concept of job lock to stay at their employment for fear of not um, getting other term, uh, other forms of employment. And because there's this social aspect that I think we've all become very aware of um, that provides fulfillment um, and the sense of uh, normalcy um, and critical health benefits. So patients tend to not want to move or lose their job. And if you go back to um, another financial crisis in 2008 with uh, sub uh, prime mortgages um, uh, and you know high mortgages that were uh, doled out to uh, high risk borrowers, um, we saw that uh, about 25,000 people with cancer undergoing treatment during this crisis would lose their coverage because of this recession. And so. When you look at what's the consequence of losing your job um, in a financial crisis, uh, this study looked at job displacement um, and mortality over time. And so job displacement, losing your job. Um, so there is almost a doubling uh, in the proportion of mortality for people who have lost their job or changed jobs. And so Again, what's fascinating is the long-term uh, consequences. So even 20 years after displacement, um, there's still an increase in your death um, uh, risk. And 
again, I, I think some of the themes that are highlighted is potentially you can't make up for that time and the hits that happen um, uh, during uh, that period of uh, high financial toxicity. And, um, you know, how is cancer different? You know, I think a question that ha um, also arises that, you know, there's a lot of other costs that are associated with diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and a number of other um, comorbidities. Um, but what is shown is that cancer tends to be more sensitive uh, to financial strain. And so a, a sort of theory to think about this is that there's a macro environment um, that uh, has, um, when you consider uh, cardiovascular disease or diabetes, that when you take into account lifestyle changes like smoking or exercise, those things have stayed relatively stable over time. Um, and when you think of cancer and the exponential increases in um, treatments like, uh, you know, uh, immunotherapy or oral um, therapies that need to be taken uh, indefinitely or for a greater duration, you can see that there's um, uh, less of um, a buffer. And so there's way higher expenses um, that have changed uh, for cancer compared to these other um, uh, comorbidities. And I think another uh, aspect that really ties into um, all of uh, this, especially mortality, is the impact on mental health. Um, this study looked at economic suicides during the, the Great Recession um, in Europe and North America, and there was um, uh, shown to have uh, 10,000 additional suicides in that time uh, between Europe and, and North America, and unemployment was strongly associated with suicide in this study. And so, um, you know, what's concerning is that um, patients with cancer already have a higher risk of suicide, um, you know, two to four fold increase. And what we know and what's been reported for our patients is that head and neck cancer patients have an even higher rate of suicide than patients with other types of cancer. And so Looking at um, another aspect of um, a coping mechanisms, uh, you know, what happens to treatment uh, adherence during a financial uh, crisis? And this comes back to the question of, is it really non-compliance? So this study looks at um, uh, breast cancer therapy and um, the graph shows um, a radiation therapy uh, and uh, surgery, uh, surgery in red, radiation therapy in green. And basically, there is a with a 1% um, uh, uh, increase in unemployment, um, there were significant uh, decreases in radiotherapy and surgery received. And uh, another concept is. Um, Patients don't have to just worry about um, their medications or um, their appointment visits. Um, something that uh, was highlighted uh, in this pandemic, this is the Muni lot in Cleveland, which I had to look up what the Muni lot uh, even was. And this shows a food bank um, uh, back in the fall. Um, and, you know, our patients have to make a decision between food and uh, care, but even though you know, initially I thought toilet paper was really um, more critical than food. And this was at the start of the pandemic. It seems like you couldn't get toilet paper and people weren't really thinking about food. Um, so uh, besides toilet paper and food, um, patients with cancer really have to um, worry, have more um, food insecurity than uh, other um other people. Um, and so here, uh, this study looks at um, financial worry and food insecurity. And you can see that with a lower income, uh, there's a greater um, a proportion of uh, financial um, worry and um, a greater proportion of food insecurity. And, um, you know, this goes in line with number of comorbidities, and this comes back to the concept of disparities in care and what else goes into, um, you know, compliance with treatment. So again, you know, what happens to treatment, and you can insert basically anything, cancer care, a pandemic, a financial crisis, you know, what it, what is it really non-compliance? And so 
Um, this study is out of New Mexico, um, which has one of the highest um, rates in the country of food insecurity. Um, and we can see that patients who were um, uh, newly food insecure or had persistent food insecurity, you know, uh, gave up um, these, uh, you know, um, things that we find uh, are critical to care and what we think as being compliant to treatment. So they give up follow-up care, they give up mental health, um, they give up taking their prescriptions. And so what um, we sort of thought of is that, um, or how we kind of can uh, interpret this is that um, cancer patients are a, a significantly vulnerable population and they can be doubly hit by the cost of cancer care and their financial strain and whatever other strain is imposed whether it's again a, pan a pandemic a natural disaster a recession you know something which seems to be happening at any one of point in time in addition to their cancer care and so this um group, uh, this cancer consortium, um, out of, again, out of Washington, is uh, looking at um, uh, mortality with COVID patients um, uh, in, can um, in the cancer population. And uh, it's a similar theme. Um, pa patients who have cancer um, with COVID are dying at three times the rate. Um, patients react differently to some COVID-19 therapies. Uh, for example, um, steroids in this paper, um, uh, steroids that can decrease some of the um, treatment, so, sorry, some of the symptoms or duration of symptoms actually um, are worse off in cancer patients. And there are, um, again, racial disparities um, in terms of access to remdesivir um, and other treatments. So, you know, what do we do about all this? Um, we need better data and we need, um, you know, data that's rooted in scientific investigation. And so um, how do we move from just talking about this problem to actually uh, doing something about this? And so, you know, when you break it down into the framework of, you know, four things, you look at the problem, you try to measure it, um, you engage stakeholders, and then you just implement solutions. This seems, you know, like a pretty easy thing. Um, but then you come back to, um, the health uh, system question. And um, I think there's always the question that gets asked, you know, is universal health insurance the answer um, to financial toxicity? And so let's look at a case. Um, this is Canada, which is the national health insurance uh, model. Um, and, you know, most um, care, medically necessary care is free um, for residents at the point of service. Um, most of this is financed through tax revenue and it's um, all um, uh, distributed through a decentralized um, administration model. And uh, this study looks at out-of-pocket costs um, for again, breast cancer um, in uh, Canadian women and their spouses. And um, again, the same sort of expenses that our patients pay for in the same kind of proportions even um, for surgeries and other treatments um, are found in this uh, group. And here, higher wage losses were associated with, again, worse um, perception of uh, financial situation. Um, and in this um, study, what you look at, um, another study that looks at Canada um, and uh, prostate cancer, you know, total costs in this group was about 10% of income, even for patients with universal health insurance. And so when you go back to the Commonwealth definition of underinsurance, that means that most of these patients are underinsured, even with universal health care coverage. And so in, this is in no way trying to make any sort of political statements, but I, I do think it's really important to um, not lose sight of what coverage means, you know, um, for the sake of being universal. And I think it's really important that we make sure that people can get and really afford uh, the care um, when they actually need it. Um, and so there are a number of mitigation strategies at multiple levels, um, all the way from uh, big picture um, health policy down to patients and their families. Um, and there again are so many ways and so many angles to uh, intervene and it's uh, a bit overwhelming if you think you want to tackle this problem um, but 
I think there are some very simple um, uh, interventions that we can consider. Um, so financial assistance is uh, one of these sort of interventions. And um, when you look at um, most programs or um, NCI designated uh, cancer programs, you know, most of these places have financial assistance programs. But what you see is that they need assistance with assistance. You know, this is a model of what it's like for a patient to get through um, a financial assistance um, program. And I mean, for anybody, uh, let alone somebody who may have lower health literacy, I think this um, this uh, model is really difficult to navigate. Um, and this was a study done um, out of UNC that looked at, you know, does it even make really a difference? And um, what was found um, was that financial uh, navigation at all levels, underinsured and insured, um, actually reduced financial toxicity. So, you know, is that sort of the end? Financial navigation is the answer, um, and, and no, obviously. And so. Um, we performed a prospective a longitudinal study looking at financial toxicity that was supported by a core grant. And we had uh, three time points, basically at the time of diagnosis, mid-treatment, um, and uh, at the end of treatment, which are estimated end of treatment around six months. Um, Along with patients, we are we have surveyed caregivers to try to understand the relationship between caregiving and financial toxicity. And at the end of the study, there's a, a semi-structured um, exit interview um, to, to sort of um, collect more qualitative information on all of this survey uh, data. Um, this is in line with health claims that are being collected in parallel. And um, you know, at this time, we have completed enrollment um, with about 64 patients enrolled. Um, and even though that doesn't seem like a lot, um, enrolling patients in a longitudinal study during the height of the pandemic was an incredible challenge. And again, this goes back to the efforts and creativity of the team that made this happen. And so I'm really proud of the 64 patients we managed to get uh, during the pandemic. So um, we're currently analyzing this data, so stay tuned. Um, and uh, we've recently put in a core grant um, with uh, collaborators at Penn. So this is Dr. Kretney, who's a PGY3, and Dr. Brody, who's a, a assistant professor here. And um, here, the um, purpose of the study is to look at implementation of a financial uh, navigation system for patients with oropharynx squame. And so, you know, I think the um, a, a, um, usual response as well, you know, patients with oropharynx tend to be of higher sociodemographic and they do better off. And so why is this really a problem for those people? You know, and again, this comes back to concepts that we've already seen. It's not about absolute wealth. It's about loss of wealth. Um, patients with oropharynx cancer tend to be younger, which is one of the uh, risk factors for toxicity. Um, they tend to undergo radiation therapy and potentially um, uh, dual or trimodality uh, therapies. So, you know, this is a group that's actually prime um, for uh, financial toxicity. And so um, the grant is currently being reviewed. And so, you know, is it um, possible that we can create sort of a screening uh, tool that's not given in a clinic, um, it's not given in a person, but it's uh, delivered, um, you know, uh, through a mobile device um, that can calculate a toxicity in real time and at different time points, and then can provide automated uh, assistance. Um, and this can change depending on uh, responses of, you know, um, toxicity uh, metrics that are taken again in real time. And then, you know, can we do this not just on a national level, but can we do it on a global level and then actually measure the impact of interventions? Um, and I don't think this is so far off. This is an example of an automated financial assistance program. Um, it uses a robotic process automation um, to actually uh, identify patients that are um, that may qualify for certain programs. It actually helps patients fill out the forms um, automatically. It helps 
um, institutions file the forms uh, automatically. And so um, this has been shown to not only benefit patients, but actually reduce uh, losses for the health system. And so, you know, do we need to start thinking about financial toxicity as a true quality metric? And um, there have been other quality measures um, that have been um, reported to reduce disparities in care um, and are critical um, to accredit institutions. And, you know, is it time for us to um, have a financial a screen as part of this quality metric. And here this group um, proposes the adoption of this screening um, in practice. And I think this is where something like the FDQ um, comes into play. You know, something like a two question, really easy screen is feasible, I think, for a lot of clinical practices. Um, tools that require calculation and calibrations, I think are sometimes a little bit more challenging uh, in the real world. And so um, the idea also for the grant proposal that's been placed um, with Dr. Cretney and Brody is, um, you know, is the FDQ um, a good screening tool? And so, um, you know, I think it takes a lot <laughs> to get there. You know, these are all of the uh, stakeholders that uh, need to be involved in order to um, uh, implement a quality metric um, and uh, understand the impact on outcomes. Um, so, you know, with that, I really thank you for your time and um, I'll take any questions. Hi, this is, uh, uh, this is Paul Bryce, and I just wanted to say congratulations on a great talk and a really difficult topic. Um, I appreciate it, uh, seeing you put it into the context of other cancers, too. It, it seems like it would track with some of the more common ones like lung, prostate, and, and breast cancer. And then I, I had a question, you know, I, you know I, you health and cancer, you think of as almost like a catastrophic health event. Do you see the same financial toxicity with other sort of acute, you know, catastrophic events like stroke, hmm. you know, acute cardiac events that require some hospitalization, rehabilitation that, that can sometimes be ongoing and affect speech and language and yes. all these other activities of life. Does, does this financial toxicity track in those areas as well? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I haven't looked at it from that perspective, and I um, am curious to see um, or look um, more specifically at studies that have looked at financial toxicity in comorbidities or chronic illnesses and whether or not they um, really consider events like that um, as part of that um, health um, um, uh, treatment duration. And so I think that's a really great question. Um, I think that's also a question that can be answered with the power of large scale databases. Um, and so there are there are some databases that um, include large scale claims um, that can look at specific instances like that in the context of patients with cardiovascular mortality, uh, sorry, cardiovascular disease or neurologic disease. So I think it's a great question um, and it can be applied to you know, a lot of other disease models. Hey, this is Rob. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I've got great que uh, two questions. First, great talk. Really, really enjoyed it, and I appreciate how thorough you were. Um, the first question was around your methodology. You mentioned that as when you were at UPMC, because they have their own plan, mm -hmm. you found it more um, feasible to get claims data. Tell us a little bit about um, how you go about getting claims data. So I would guess that there's a firewall even when you're at UPMC between the clinical side and the yeah. insurance side. And then when you're not working with UPMC, what's your favorite source of claims data and what's the process of getting them? 
So um, to answer the first question, one, it's to partner with the health insurance plan. And so um, there is a strategic analysis um, claims group that's basically an analytical group that's part of the health plan. And we've been working hand in hand with that group to be able to extract this information. I think without um, a partner um, uh, or somebody engaged on that side, it is very difficult to get that information. Um, and, you know, in the same way that it's a benefit, it also is a potentially a bias. You know, I don't know what patients who don't have um, UPMC affiliated health plan insurance um, members, you know, I don't know what their costs are. And so there could be a bias in that um, that I can't capture from, uh, from this study. To answer your other question, um, there is currently a database that um, we're working with. It's a behemoth of a database, the Optum Claims Database. Um, it is a large, large database um, that uh, is longitudinal claims um, that can be, I think, very powerful to answer some of these questions. Again, not just for cancer, but for other disease models. Um, there have been a few studies, I'd be happy to share them with you, from, from head and neck cancer. It's been used in, uh, again, other disease models. But I think that um, I'm excited about that database, um, you know, but it's, it's challenging. It's a challenging task because it is so large. <laughs> so, and you pay for access to that? How do you get access? To yes, that? you have to pay for it. I um, am lucky that it's an institutional um um, subsidized institutionally here through the Leonard Davis Health Institute um, of Economics. And so that's really why I've been able to access it as an individual. There's no way. Um, I mean, we're talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for this database. Um, I do have the contact information too for those reps. I'm happy to share that with you. They also have um, Optum has an oncology specific database, which is even more granular detail for oncology claims. I don't know how much more information we can get from head and neck, just because, again, it's not one of those large cancer groups that, you know, gets really represented in, in databases like that. But I'll share some info. Yeah. And my second question is a little bit more of a leading question. Um, Michael Porter's three domains of health outcomes. Are you familiar with those? I read that book when I was in undergraduate, or I read some of his books when I was in undergraduate. Um, so. so I'm just thinking, you know, the first tier was survival or, or degree of health recovery. The second tier was kind of the process of care. How long did it take you to get well? And did you have a bunch of complications? And then the third tier was, you know, your long-term outcome as far as your sustainability of health and et cetera. And it, it's kind of, you know, I think you're you're looking upon this financial toxicity of let's attack the financial toxicity question. You know, are people at risk? How can you mitigate that risk, et cetera? Um, an interesting question would be, how good are we as providers? <laughs> and, you know, if we goof and the patient has either recurrence or a complication or a prolonged medical problem, if they get if they become deaf because of the chemotherapy, for example, if we can avoid those things do we prevent some level of financial toxicity? Kind of taking what we're, is in our wheelhouse traditionally, which is good quality of care, and then equating better quality of care with reduced financial toxicity, other than just going back to see who's at risk and can sure. we mitigate that risk? Have I you mean, done some of that? Have you thought about that? And so, kind of getting to that second domain of that speed of care, the efficacy of care, and the lack of complications and problems during care. So I think that's the next level. Um, you know, that's uh, where we need to go to. And in terms of asking the question, how are we at pro at good as providers? So there's literature to show that providers are very um, bad at talking about costs of care. Um, and um, what may be surprising is that patients actually appreciate when providers bring up cost of care and don't interpret it as um, necessarily biasing the care that's given. And so I think sometimes, you know, the fear is that we don't want to talk about costs because it can, you know, potentially influence the treatment decision. And I just want to talk about the treatments. But, you know, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. It's, you know, the, the cost of care goes into treatment adherence. And so um, how can you deliver a treatment um, if it if it doesn't get you know accessed and so um, you know I think getting to that next level that you're talking about is ideally where we should go. 
Uh, I'm just just to make one last comment. I'm thinking a little, little bit differently, and that is, let's say we don't bring up any financial concerns with the patient whatsoever. Yeah. But we do a great job in taking care of them quickly, no complications, back to health. Mm-hmm. That's kind of our core competency traditionally as a as a provider. It seems like the risk of financial toxicity, as opposed to a patient with multiple complications, recurrences, extended hospitalizations, et cetera, it seems like that would have less financial toxicity if you do a great job. So kind of bringing this back to our traditional wheelhouse, which is simply quality of care and what is the risk of financial toxicity when patients don't do well with our care, just an idea. Absolutely, yeah. That was excellent, uh, Layla. Um, well articulate, articulated in an area I think that um, has thus far been untapped in head and neck cancer. Um, have you, uh, or has has there been much work, uh, I suspect more outside of head and neck cancer is, this seems to be particularly novel within the field of, of how uh, this ultimately impacts medical decisions. And, and I guess what I'm thinking of is, um, really, um, those with lower socioeconomic status making kind of inferior choices, particularly related to cancer, whether to go more locally, for example, than to more of a tertiary care center and, and how that um, impacts um, or, or how that's tied to their initial um, financial fragility. So I, the first part of that question, um, you know, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, lung cancer, this has been much more extensively uh, studied. And it's, um, it's funny that head and neck is like this untapped area. But when you think of our patients, they're so different than breast or lung or, you know, our patients have serious functional deficits from a communication standpoint, you know, we know this swallowing that you can't hide and you can't necessarily always compensate for. And so I think that comes down directly back to the employment issue. Um, and so, so one, there, there are, and then another, um, sort of another aspect that you bring up is this, um, decision regret concept. And so, um, we potentially are biased as providers that we think everybody it wants cure. And that's true. When you look at reports of how patients um, prioritize um, uh, their values during care, cure is generally number one. And then quality of life, you know, so patients do tend to want cure at all costs, let's say. Um, but if you look at certain uh, demographic profiles, there are patients who would prefer to forego care so that their children can go to school or that their uh, children uh, uh, won't be left in a life of uh, poverty. And so, you know, I think um, I don't I know that there's nothing in head and neck that has shown that. Um, I'm sure there must be something in the other cancer groups. It's not something I've come across necessarily, but I haven't really looked at it from that angle. So I think that's a really great question. Um, but again, frailty, decision making, shared decision making, decision regret, um, you know, all these things, financial toxicity, all these things go hand in hand. Um, so. Well, that's uh, eight o'clock unless there's other questions. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Maddie. Thanks. And, um, appreciate your time as well as um, all, all the work that you've done on the topic. I think it's uh, it's very exciting.